So, Donald, thanks very much for coming in for a chat. How are Real you? My pleasure. Shana. Good, good. Yeah. Um, it's very appropriate, I think, that we're here in the Rory Gallagher Music Library, obviously. Um, they're celebrating 40 years. It, it was renamed Rory Gallagher Music Library in 2004, was it? Around I think that? You're right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and also, of course, you're celebrating the seventh anniversary, seventieth anniversary of Rory's birth. So, you must be very busy since March, are you? Yeah, it, it has been a busy year. Um, there's been all sorts of good things, and part of um, him being honoured for his seventieth was the Central Bank of Ireland designed and produced a coin in Rory's honour, and President Michael D. Higgins very kindly did the honours in, in the launch of that coin. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, it's, so Rory is 2018, and then there's going to be Phil in it in 2019 and Luke Kelly in 2020, but you didn't know about it, did you? As such, it was a surprise, was it? Um, bizarrely, uh, I came in to see Liam Ronan here in the library one day, and uh, first thing Liam said to me, he said, Oh, I said, that's a coincidence, you dropping in to see me, he said, I just had a call from the Central Bank. They were looking for contact details. So I, I said, why would the Central, you know, and he said, oh, I think they want to do a coin. And I was going... You know and, that. And, and of course then, you're waiting to hear, and of course a, a number of weeks went by, and uh, they did get in touch, but it got postponed three or four times. Mm -hmm. So there was a few false dawns, so you were dying to tell people, but... Uh, between them trying to find the mint and then finding somebody to design, to design it. Yeah. So, and that was actually a nice learning curve because you don't look at the intricacies of, uh, you know about making albums or s stage shows or whatever you do, but uh, the, the, so it was um, Martin Guilfoyle, he's a, a Welsh designer. Yeah. So they put me in touch with him because the bank had the attitude they can do this anyway without just stick a picture on there and drawing and I said no that so they they got this guy and then he had been you know his music fan and so he went back and revisited all Rory's records and music and actually went to see a few Rory tribute bands mm -hmm. and we had great conversations uh, how do you put Rory's whole world into one, one side coin. it's one side of a coin because yeah. the other side I, is the harp obviously yeah. the symbol of it and um, so we got it down which is for the purposes of, of the whole the coin is a vinyl record ah, yeah. and it's actually live in Europe which uh, I'll offend a few people by saying it's a, it's a little um, statement towards when Rory first produced uh, live in Europe that was 1972 going to 73 and it was a subtle way of ticking the box to join Europe. Mm. It was a, 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 a subtle pro-European, because people didn't, Europe at that time was a name, was after, you know. So uh, I thought, well, it's ironic that Brexit is happening now. So when he said to me, which vinyl would you put in? I said, well, let's go back to live in Europe. Mm. And uh, Brilliant. there you go. And, and is it true that there was 3,000 issued, but they all went in one day, was it? Literally a yeah, day. Yeah, because I actually was. heard it from Liam Ronane too. I didn't know they were being issued at all. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. yeah it's pretty, yeah. 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 But they're gone. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's brilliant. Oh, I, dro I dropped a lot. I mean, I'll only be downgrade. Because I, I thought, well, fine, I'll, I'll leave it to their generosity, thinking. <laughs> and I dropped a big hint and said, well, I have four kids for a start. <laughs> you know, and then. So I got one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, l luckily, I had, I had gone online to buy some, to hold some, to hang on or, or some for yeah. whatever reason in the future. And uh, they were kind of saying, oh, well, we're not sure about this order. And I said, well, come on, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so they sent them by post from Dublin, and they got lost in the post. <laughs> <laughs> That's really an so Irish story. <laughs> I had enormous <laughs> difficulty going back down and, and getting them to, because from I couldn't track it from the UK, so they had to track it, from anyway, it, they turned up eventually. Eventually got them, yeah, cool. So. And you, uh, when were the albums re-released? Was that um, at the beginning of the year or last year? That was just the, um, yeah, that was the beginning of, of this year, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I was getting mixed up with the Wheels and Wheels, which they was the first time that was issued in Vine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the catalogue came, 
So we had been with Sony, and so moved Rory's catalog over to Universal. Um, I mean, Sony were great, and we talked to the other companies, but mm -hmm. given the nature of today's downloading, it's a different, yeah. completely different uh, Business world. Yeah. And so we had to look at uh, how the, you know Rory is in the, the, the sort of download world and. The physical, the vinyl is, is great that that's come back up and that'll be there. Yeah. For, uh, so, uh, but Dan, my other son, is he's based in New York. He's now a consultant to Universal. So we looked at all the electronic sites. So he's taking on the catalog and yeah. having to, uh, you know, so. But it was a really great move because I think, is this true that um, between the, in the blues and jazz uh, UK charts, 15 of the albums were in the top 30, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so massively successful. And the Irish Tour 74 was number one. Number one. Yeah, so. wow. So that really shows like about the legacy is still growing, still expanding. And um, you, do you find that there's a lot of young people coming on board now as well? They're getting starting to get to know Rory's music and... Yeah, well, it, it's that... It's, it's kind of strange the way things have evolved for me because I often say to myself, uh, how would Rory feel about YouTube, or mm. how would he feel about the download? Or I mean, he was such a vinyl fanatic, in, yeah. and because uh, even with the vinyl, when I, I remember seeing a shot of John Lennon on the paper at the time, and uh, he had a button saying "Back to Mono," and I was going, "The cheek of the him, you know." We've all gone out to buy, you know, the stereo version of Sgt. Pepper's because you know, and now he's telling everybody. And Rory said, "Oh, I agree with him yeah. completely because it's it rock and roll is jukebox music, comes out of one big speaker, mm -hmm. you know." So it was, and I was going, "Well, hang on, you know, everybody wants to hear the left and the right, and of course, doing sound mixing and audio st engineering and stuff, you always wanted to have the." The mm. symbols and mm. uh, the, you know, but it was like no, oh, it's rock and roll's direct. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's kind of actually going back to when you were a young boy yourself and you were observing Rory as he developed. And you remember obviously he was uh, playing the uke first, wasn't it? And then he went on to the guitar and went and expanded from there. Do you remember? Yeah. Kind of witnessing when you when you observed him, and you realized that he's an exceptional talent. Can you remember that a moment, or did it? Like, was it just second nature to you in the family that you didn't pay much attention at the time? No, no I'm, I remember him being very frustrated about trying to explain yeah. a guitar. And uh, we were living in Derry at that time, and my father, who was a piano accordion player, and had his own Katie Dance Orchestra in his day, the Inishon Katie Dance Orchestra. So um, this whole new fangled music and... Well, it started with Chris Barber, Lonnie Donegan. Yeah. The port of Derry had been given over to the Americans in the Second World War, so this is post-war. But they were still there because of the uh, whole threat from uh, so-called the Cold War mm -hmm. from Russia. So they used the north of Ireland uh, to monitor all the fleets. Of, uh, so, But the Americans had their AFN mast. So any radio you turned on, it, it automatically, it was so... The crystals just picked it up. Yeah. So Rory was listening to the jazz hour. When my parents, because we lived in this, they might pop in next door. So we'd, you weren't allowed at the radio. Rory'd fiddle around with the radio, and he to get AFN. He knew I couldn't. He knew the schedule when the jazz hour was on, because it, it used to scare the living daylights out of me because it'd be the, the voice of America, the jazz hour. <laughs> You know, it sounded like the devil. Yeah. I mean, it really, you know, when you were a kid. And then the music was was so out there, out and, there. and, you know, abstract. And you kind of go, you know, that's what he was listening to. So slowly the, the, the blues element came in behind that, actually. It was a jazz element that he was listening to mm. more than... So, but the guitar was the thing, and I remember him getting round cheese box craft or whatever it was, and a school ruler, and elastic bands and my mother would say but that's a banjo and he's going oh, yeah but it's like I can't cut out the sides and mm -hmm. so she sent away for um, it was it, it wasn't a ukulele it, it, it turned out to be a plastic ukulele yeah. if you like but it was he wanted the Lonnie Donegan model yeah and 
Anyway, whatever the mix-up, he got the Elvis Presley model. And he wasn't that happy about yeah, it. Yeah. He wanted Lonnie Don again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he got used to it. So then the family was moving to Cork um, to sort of uh, pacify Rory that he'd be going to a new school, etc. Yeah. that uh, he'd be allowed to get a wooden uh, acoustic guitar. Very good. And Thereby so that, yeah. the with your dad. <laughs> then there's the connection, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm wondering also, do you remember observing him when, like, he was supposedly quiet and shy, but yet when he went on stage, he just transformed. Um, do you remember that moment when you saw him, you know, turning it on on stage? And were you shocked or were you kind of going, yeah, that's, he's, that's what he's like, really? Or how did you feel about that? Well, the first indication that I got it that he was a performer because we'd go, I don't know, it was the Tommy Steele film, and Tommy Steele was a bit of a rock and roller in the beginning, and uh, when very scared, but we'd go up to the Diamond in the centre of Derry on a Saturday night uh, to watch the 6-5 special, which was the first, it was a black and white music show, which usually featured Lonnie Donegan. Mm. Uh, but you couldn't hear the sound, all you could do was see the pictures. And there'd be maybe 50 people standing outside the shop window looking at the television sure. screen and no music. <laughs> but Rory had learnt all the lyrics. So um, he could tell from the lip syncing, he'd start singing the songs. Wow. And he'd, he'd, it was like, his, you know, kid, shut up, Rory, yeah. shut up, they're all. No, he was in a trance. Yeah. He was already, he, was, he had an audience. Yeah. He, and he was performing. So it was already so happening at that stage. He was already, um, so then when we came down, of course, once he got the guitar and a few chords, uh, it was like, where could he perform? So, yeah. um, so was it kind of liberating for him, really, I suppose, was it the whole thing and going up on stage? He was letting yeah. it all out, like all the energy and... Yeah, he used to get a normal stage fright. Mm. But I now realise that looking back and, you know, I, I can't go on and I can't. And it, but actually what it is, is it, it's the excitement. Yeah. That's what he wants to be doing. He doesn't want to be off stage. Yeah. In fact, the best, one of the best tributes ever paid was, uh, God rest the man, Steve Wolf. He was a, a Californian promoter uh, who actually got murdered. <coughs> he produced the Star Wars concerts and he was shot with the box office takings. Anyway. But Steve Wolf was a good friend and he'd come over and I remember he called me aside one day because you'd be on these maybe large festival bills or package bills with everybody else. And he said, Dan, you know, he said, your brother's unique. He said, of all the artists I know, he's the only artist that comes over here and never threatens you with not going on stage. He said, and he's the only one who threatens you with not coming off as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which sounds wrong. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. it used to cost them more yeah. if you overran the concert because the union, the hall and the scales. And the ah, right. Yeah. So Rory would blow the whatever <laughs> percentage bonus you run by... Not getting off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's also really interesting. I find that um, the top guitarists of the world rate him as their number one. Like the mm -hmm. likes of um, Slash and uh, Hendrix even and um, Clapton and so on. And yet, even with that status, what I really like is that he was still uh, somebody who connected with his fans and so on. And like Noel from the shop, you remember Noel? He went to see Don't him in know? the city hall and yeah. um, he caught him just as he was coming off stage. And he was sta standing there chatting to him for quite a long time. And he stayed there quite enthusiastically giving him tips. Did you see a lot of that? Was that always going on? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, he didn't want to leave the venue. Mm. Uh, oddly, last night I was watching a documentary about Alex uh, Hurricane Higgins, and they had this footage of uh, Alex Blesserman in his, his last few days, and they're actually covering the tarpaulin over the the the, the, the table, and mm. they're, uh, they're kind of trying to, <coughs> and he's sitting there, and they didn't want to leave the venue. Rory was exactly same the same. Same thing, yeah. He needed a crowbar, and he preferred nothing better than say, because uh, in the end he'd stay there or he'd stand at the back door, and he'd be, he'd been on stage sweating for hours. So you'd yeah. be trying to get him back to the hotel. You didn't want to be rude, but he just wanted to stay there. He didn't want to go. Mm. Like that was 
I don't want to go back to the reality my day job thing. or it's my like, day yeah. life. I want to yeah. be here, uh, staying there. I yep. want to be in the because he he. It was also the chatting of um, everything to do with music because I remember he used to come into the shop a lot, obviously, and he'd ring up and say, is your dad going to be there at closing? And I'd say, yeah, and, and I knew then that I was going to be still in the shop hours later kind of thing, waiting for my lift home. But he used to come in and they'd be cha just talking and talking about all the equipment. That, and he'd probably tell my dad a few things that he could pick up some brands and um, he'd ask Mick, where did that come from and who made this? And they'd be just chatting nonstop. Like, I mean... It, I think it's great, you know. Um, that interest was always there. Um, do you, did you think like? I, I don't know. I, I think it was a passion in every sense, like you know. It was oh, obviously, totally. it, yeah. it was an obsession. I mean, it, it was it, uh, uh, interesting. But one of the lads sent me a link yesterday. They found an old interview from back to seventy-three, four, one of some American publication, and and it reminded it, what it was is about Rory talking to the guy about. Um, in Denver about guitar trading. No, I thought, oh yeah, because, I mean, the collection of instruments he had, that's, yeah. th th you know, it's like paintings or whatever, that's what yeah. he collected. And it turned out the National Steel Guitar. Lucky we found it, it had, it, he'd bought it off the trader because it was Scrapper Blackwell's guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so he would, and he'd, he'd stay there for hours, particularly with guitar, anything, instruments. Yeah. Uh, he'd entertain them. And then, you know, he'd have been up all night and he'd have, they'd be around at the hotel the next morning bringing some other instruments. And it was just nonstop. Non -stop, it, yeah. it, it, you used to get, kind of get a little bit boring from my point of view. I remember one day in, uh, he, we'd half a day off. I don't know that we'd even, or maybe we might <laughs> have had a full day. And he'd be looking forward to a long lie-in and, uh, you know. So uh, he said, oh, would you drive me down to Valley Sound at the guitar store? And, okay. Do you really need, oh, well, I want to look and I see, and I'll only have the opportunity. That's what he did with his time Good off. Tough free time, yeah. And, of course, I, I, I think I had a bit of a hangover as well. I can, <laughs> okay, I'll drive you down, but it's hard parking down there. So I said, I'll have to stay with the car. car. I won't go into the store if you don't mind, Rory, mm -hmm. because, you know. And I knew bloody well as soon He's as gonna be he in went the into the stores. All the fellows would start paying whatever the musician's riff was, yeah. you know, at full volume or the smoke in the water or whatever, full volume, and I'm going, I can't do this. And <laughs> so he went in and standing, standing with it, feeding the meter and feeding the meter. And so, so it was always by. like that. Yeah. Now, I was parked outside a pawn shop and I was looking at the pawn shop and I thought, well, see what he turns up. And I was just out of it. And I spotted a guitar up the back and I thought, oh. Actually, it wasn't the guitar, but it was the guitar case. We needed a case for something else. And I thought, well, I'll see what the price of this guitar is and the case. And so the guy said, oh, it's a couple of hundred bucks. And I went, oh. And he said, well, how much have you got? And I said, oh, um, 50, $50. It wasn't the case. It wasn't, it was just the case I wanted. And, um, so anyway, I got $55. Uh, and not, not thinking, put the guitar in the case. All I knew was Gretsch, and I thought, well, that'll be grand. Yeah. Put it in the boot of the car, waited another hour. Rory came out, all disappointed. <coughs> I said, you were in that time, and you didn't get anything. He said, oh, no, a few things, and he was, ha he was a great haggler, by the way. Yeah. And uh, so the next thing, and I said, well, I said, I, I picked up a guitar in the boot. I said, but it's the case is really good. I said, the guitar is probably crap. And you'd probably tell me I paid for too much for it. So I opened it and, and he looked and he said, you put it? I said, yeah, just the pawn shop there. And he said, the, the, the Gretsch Corvette. He said, you got it for $55. And I said, yeah. He said, let's get out of here quickly. <laughs> He's very happy. <laughs> so it was the only time I ever got one on him. For yeah. Brilliant. While well, you were waiting for him, um, the number six four three five one is very significant to you. I think it should be. What am I referring it's not to? My phone number. <laughs> the, the Stratocaster. Yeah, <laughs> the serial number. Yeah, the yeah. serial number of the Strat that my dad sold, uh, Rory. But um, I was wondering, like you're obviously the keeper, the guardian of the guitar, um, and uh, I mean it's a pretty cool job. I think all the, the whole thing that you're looking after, all the the whole lot of it. Like, but um, do you get leaned on? by celebrities to let them play the guitar? Not so much leaned on, yeah, I mean, at, um, at Joe Bonamassa yeah. made a request because he was playing the Albert Hall 
and but now I see you can buy on his website very good prints of him at Rory Stratton. Uh, uh, yeah, that was a terrific. Um, because uh, oddly enough, I was put sitting, I took the guitar down, and, and then I noticed there was a couple of seats away from Nigel Kennedy, yeah. the violinist, yeah. who actually turned out to be a Rory fan. So mm. when the track came out, and uh, so then more recently on the radio, I heard him talking about Rory's. Uh, improvisational skills mm. that inspired him so uh, so it to give the guitar an outing like that it's it's it, it, it's it's good out that, I, yeah. I, I, I do get a lot of stick from a lot of fans how dare he couldn't tie Rory shoelaces blah 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 <laughs> uh, Johnny Mars another I mean oh yeah I've seen him play it on YouTube I think yeah I mean he genuinely is a Rory devotee because mm. uh, and I, I, I I remember meeting Johnny with the Smiths, and they were the opening act on a bill up in Finland. Uh, and he, he kind of, it was a festival, and they were on the day before, and they were trying to get in back the next night to see Rory. So that's first reacquaintance. But I, I don't know that Rory was that much impressed with the, the Smiths. It was like <laughs> that new era kind of thing. Yeah. Because I brought them backstage, and I remember Rory making it. Because they were doing this kind of uh, beatly uh, uh, kind of, and he said, "Oh, who are they, the monkeys?" <laughs> yeah, no, it's kind of not he wasn't so, impressed. But actually, yeah. they became the best yeah. of friends. And yeah, they used yeah. to, I know that they'd go to the. Johnny moved into the same area where Rory was in mm. London, and they used to meet up. So there was there were a lot more conversations that I never knew had. <clears throat> but one morning, I, the phone rang, and it was um, Johnny Martin. He said, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm." And I said, oh, I believe so, Johnny. I mean, what can I do for you? And he said, <clears throat> at some point, if I come to London, could I hold Rory's guitar? Would that be OK? And I said, yeah, sure. When do you want to come? And he said, could I come tomorrow morning? <laughs> and it was that, you know, once he got a yes. Yeah, he was there, yeah. Straight. So that was a very good day. I spent mm. the day. And, um, and uh, in fact, then he did a concert at... Shepherd's Bush last year, and, and he asked to use the Strat. Again. It, it, it was part homage to Rory, yeah. so he, he, yeah. he did do that. And um, the Telecaster, I mean, he's, you have to get all the toys out. It's like, can I play with his dinky toys, you know? Yeah. Okay. So he goes through all the guitars, and of course, then it's, you know, and it's keeping the guitars, you keep the original strings because then. You think, oh, this guitar player will sue me if he gets a rusty string, and <laughs> you want to keep the original. You know, it's like, yeah. but you do. I and mean, then, and then we do the, the exhibitions. So we did <coughs> one in Olympia last month. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. So it came out for that as well. Yeah. So there's, there's about twenty guitars, or was there twenty instruments with it? Yeah, I think we put in, ended up putting a few more. It was essentially mm. to be at, at twenty and. Um, it was part of the guitar show, mm. and it was a uh, request from Guitarist magazine. I saw the one up in Dublin, uh, I don't know how long ago now, maybe 10 years ago maybe. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was incredible. Like, is there a chance that there would ever be a permanent exhibition? Is it realistic to hope for that in Cork, do you think? <coughs> well, it, it, that, I've always sort of said that that's there to be done, mm. you know. I mean, and it's, it's finding the right, it's the location. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're still hopeful of that. Put it this way: they're, they're Rory's instruments. He went to the trouble of collecting them. You know, and, and I was waiting for the boys who play guitars, and my daughter, if she wanted to play guitar. Mm. So Dan is actually the gene that bypassed me, <laughs> went down the line to him. So he has got that lovely touch, whatever it is, mm. is in Rory's playing. So it, it comes out. And um, so that I was in, down at the office one day and I took a delivery of a, a black Stratocaster. And it was for my son. And I said, Dan, what, what's in it? And he said, oh, I bought it. And I knew it, money was tight with him at that present as all his kids. And he said, oh, that's my girl. And I said, but, you know, the storage unit, there's 150 or whatever <laughs> it was at that time. I said, you just. Go over go and pick one, yeah. He said, no, I want my own guitar. And I said, does that mean you never... And he said, no, I want to have my own guitars. And then it suddenly kind of dawns you, 
what you keep them for, what it is. But exhibition-wise, I, I think what ideally Cork would be is, is the home of the collection. Mm, yeah, yeah. But, uh, or the home of the touring collection. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, you know, I mean, one of the difficulties is you, you set up a place and the whole thing and everybody's delighted to but then, I'm sure I saw that last week. I, I, you don't want it to be that way. Mm. It has to be. Don't want saturation like as such, yeah. yeah. You did a, an exhibition here in July and August, wasn't it? Remembering Rowing exhibition as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of always contributing to these events anyway, I suppose. Yeah. It just would be, I think, lovely to see an actual dedicated space, like, you know, but anyway, that's. Uh, you it'll know. come. Yeah. I mean, it'll come. I mean, it's, 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 it's slow in coming, but yeah. all good things, etc. But I mean, that's what's brilliant about the library. Over the years, to have been able to uh, demonstrate in, in the way we do the exhibitions is, is to theme them. <coughs> okay, this year is because of the 70s, it was more generalised, but the previous ones I've done was one was exclusively uh, Rory's songwriting, mm -hmm. which is an overlooked aspect of, of him as a yeah. musician, an artist. And to display all, all the handwritten lyrics uh, and you know and then f for the fans who know the songs where he's scratched out mm. a word and changed it and I just I find that intriguing yeah. to you know find those little changes or the chord sequence that he's marked on mm. or yeah. you know and uh, so we've kept up you know it's everything uh, hoarded as much as possible and uh, the guy who d drove me up this morning saying, "Oh, have you seen Bohemian Rhapsody?" You know, and he, he, you know Queen, and of course they begin to tell you everything about oh, Queen. Yeah, you, you, it wouldn't be your sort. Of. And I was going, actually, I like remember Brian May moving into this, the bed sits next door to where tastes were, and he had a band called Smile. Now Brian is another huge fan, oh, so, yeah. and you used to gauge the other bands who were living in the street because it was bedsit land by the transits so if it was a double wheelbase mm. they were big time we were single wheelbase <laughs> still at that time and anyway I thought oh they, they're posh yeah <laughs> and uh, they were coming out of the van so uh, and it was Brian May and he came up to me and he said oh you're with the band Taste he said oh I adore the guitar the Rory the guitar player he said oh if I came to the marquee, could I get back to see him? And I said, yeah, sure, you know, just let me know. And sure enough, yes, they did. And I think that's up on YouTube as well. If you Google mm. Brian May and yeah. Rory, Rory Sound, he got it from yeah. Rory's Trouble Booster yeah. in the Vox. And uh, so Brian credited him. So anyway, that became a friendly relationship. And then uh, he stopped me one day in the street and he said, oh, we have a new band, we're going to change the name. And Freddie was with him. And... Uh, he said, but we're trying to get gigs. He said, are there any gigs going with Rory? And I said, well, <coughs> ring the agent, David Addy. And I said, Rory's touring every night. So there's bound to be slots. Yeah. So a few days later, Brian knocked on the door and said, we're doing a gig in two weeks' time with you up in Dunstable. And, uh, but does Rory do sound checks? And I went, sound checks? It was days before you just got to the gig, yeah. got on stage and did it. Uh, I said, oh, sound checks. I, was, I said, well, he, he changes his strings. He comes early sometimes to change strings. But, um, so I, I said, I'll say it to Rory. And Rory said, oh, sure, yeah, go along. So we get there and Rory changes his strings and Brian has a nice conversation. And uh, the rest of us were all a bit wary of this guy in the white astrakhan <laughs> for a coat, whatever, uh, yeah. running around backstage, the road crew were like, oh, what the fuck are they, <laughs> you know. Um, so they, they, they went on stage anyway and finished their set. Brian came running in, oh, what's Rory thing? And I said, that's Rory. And Rory said, <coughs> the singer was remarkable. He said, you know what? He said, you found a new little Richard. Yeah, it's really I think sort mm. of hit the money yeah. of of the voice and yeah. the scale, you know, probably in other ways as well. But <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, so the the guitar players, the relationship. And I see Brian the odd time. He still is yeah. devoted to. Yeah. He, he did the taste documentary, the Isle of Wight. So mm. 
we paid good homage in that. And what would have been your favourite album? What is your favourite Rory album? <sighs> it's it, that's you know it's the Desert Island disc. Which one would you say from the waves? I have no idea. Not particularly I, anything. I, I, yeah, but each one is kind of a different space and time, I suppose, because I look at the albums and you kind of, I remember more about the album, about the time surrounding mm -hmm. the album uh, and how difficult some of them were to make or, you know, I mean, Paul's taste was such a, a, a an uncharted period of yeah. time, um, particularly with, you know, it, it stuck in London, no money. Mm. My mother, bless her, sent Rory cash in the post, which was stolen by the people in the bedsit. Mm. Uh, you were really in. Um, yeah. So how is he going to make this band is splitting up? So how is he going to make another album? I mean, where are we going to go from there? Mm. So um, so you look to the first album, the Rory Gallagher, the plain black and white album. And you kind of listen to that and that actually because I ended up working for another band at that time, so Rory was kind of mm. going into the studio, but he was using for just a small fender, and he was working with the engineer who had been the engineer and on the boards, a guy called Eddie Offord. Yeah. And so I was out, I had gone from a lovely little three-piece band who had one stack, a Vox and a drum kit, and a small PA system. In fact, the same PA system inherited from the Fontana Show Band. Oh yeah, <laughs> the, the, that's so yeah. tight was the, the manager yeah. and the money. So the Harley boxes mm. that <laughs> uh, your dad used to get. Yeah, yeah. Through, so um, and the uh, little Philips amp, which I still have, mm. big yeah. order. Yeah. Uh, four channels. So anyway, the I was working for Atomic Rooster, mm. uh, the late Vince Crane keyboard player. So. And then Rory was working on the album, so I'd do some nights with him and whatever their tour was. And then Rory said, oh, I need some, I'm trying to find a, a, a piano player to do a couple of tracks with mm. him. So I said, well, Vince Crane, he said, oh, but he's an organist, which he was the big. <coughs> so I said it to Vince, I said, presumably you can play a bit of piano. And so he came down to the studio and it was lovely. It was a kind of... And he, Rory said, well, I want Barl House, so, uh, you know, and this is what I'm thinking. And Vince did it, so uh, it kind of, yeah. they're the things I sort you of remember, remember about the, the album and, and yeah. the individuals involved. And yeah, it means much more to you, obviously, as well, in every way, like, yeah. yeah. But is there a gig that stands out to you, a concert that, that you feel that was your best memory of him playing? Or is there, again, so much like that? <coughs> well, you could... Uh, 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 I'd say it was almost impossible to top the City Hall gigs. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I can say other gigs, but that would be kind of too a selfish thing because you'd be thrilled to bits that you'll come back and to Cork yeah. and you knew you'd have a crack for a couple of days. Or, you know, the, <laughs> the session after yeah, that. And, and, <laughs> you know, so it meant any time you'd play, you know, two, three, four nights or whatever at a venue mm. meant that you had the same bed for a few nights yeah. in a row rather than yeah. one night after another. Moving so constantly. Yeah, yeah, and it was Christmas, so it was always great yeah. buzz. So. And it was also a, a, a rejuvenation with Rory. That's where the new material, because he'd have a few days and he'd be at home and he used to find that's where... He wrote. Better. He wrote, yeah. 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 At home, yeah. So, and then, so in the afternoons then, they'd go in and rehearse but rehearse would be trying out new material and then hmm. he'd always throw a new one new song in and that because everybody wanted to hear what the albums were so he'd always yeah. throw in one get us ready kind of thing like yeah um, I'm wondering um, how you feel as well about there's maybe considered maybe miss opportunities for instance like the time that he went to see the Rolling Stones about maybe joining the band but at <coughs> in hindsight I think that maybe this legacy that he has left us is like even greater as, as opposed to if he had joined a band, do you think? Uh, a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I mean, I know he was stubborn and steadfast about what the way he wanted to do things, but I mean, if he had ended up being ga um, Mick Jagger's guitarist or whatever, he, he would have been lost in their world rather than what he ended up doing. Yeah. I suppose I'm looking more from a, the management. Caring, <coughs> yeah. 
it was such an accolade. Mm. I mean, that bit of history is now rewritten. Yeah. They, they did kind of, it's, it's almost a race that anyone else was in the running but Ronnie Wood. But it was very clear R Rory was absolutely the first choice because <coughs> based on who at that time would you get to replace Mick Taylor, mm. who's a fantastic first, guitarist, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the subtlety and the style and the whole thing. And prior to that, the, the, the Stones had formed their own label, Rolling Stones Records. And what had surprised Rory and, and when in 73 they formed that label, there was, um, they were asked who they would want to sign for the label. And Keith Richards said, the first person we want to sign is Rory Gallagher. Because mm. I remember going, oh Jesus, you know, Polydor will freak out, they'll throw him off the label. Yeah. One day, you know. But it, it was out there, and, um, and Peter Tosh was the other person. So, and then the guy was saying, Rory, and he said, oh, well, any guy can interpret Hank Snow, and it isn't just all the blues and it's country, and he said, that's the guy for me. So, presumably he'd heard the taste first album, Moving On, so there was a reference. So, he'd yeah. obviously been aware <coughs> yeah. through to that, so then in end of 74 into 75, Mick Taylor had gone and speculation who would, so it was out in uh, Douglas Road when we had the house out there about half twelve one night and of course at the time of the IRA and UDA and yeah. BHF and excuse me. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. So. You were very cautious and somebody rang Phones weren't plentiful at the time, half twelve at night. That was <laughs> going to be a bad call. Mm. Yeah. It was a car accident or whatever. And I heard this English accent saying, oh, um, I'm trying to get, uh, is this Rory Gallagher's number? I was going, uh, no, it's not his number directly, but can I help you? And it was like, and it was, it was going an odd way. <coughs> and I said, well, He's in another house nearby. I could get him for you, but it'll take about 10 minutes. And I said, who's looking for him? And the guy said, oh, th this is um, Ian Stewart. And I knew immediately once it was Ian Stewart, uh, <coughs> who'd founded the Stones, in fact. Mm. And, uh, and I was just about to say, Ian Stewart of the Rolling Stones. Uh, and... I go, uh, so I'll tell him, Ian Stewart of London then. He said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I went in, Rory had gone to bed, because he did a night off, and, there was a, and I woke, uh, said, Rory, look, phone's going to ring in 10 minutes. And I said, it's the Stones, I'm looking for you. And he, and he thought it was a wind up, so he refused to answer the phone. <laughs> so <laughs> this went through the night, and yeah. eventually they rang back, and I said, well, please, you know, and the conversation, so, he was to go over and start on January the 4th, <coughs> 75, meet them in Rotterdam, mm -hmm. and see how it went. So then, a few days later, the phone call was, oh, the mobile isn't ready, we're moving it back to the 14th, then it became the 16th. So this was going on. Rory was starting his own Jap uh, Japanese tour on the 28th or 29th of January. and. So this was really backing into, <coughs> so they got it together and Rory had sort of a four day, five day gap to get in, get out mm -hmm. and go to Japan. Uh, so he, they sent him a ticket to Rotterdam, which I still have. Yeah, brilliant. <coughs> um, he refused to have me go. Yeah. He said, oh, this is a jam session. <coughs> and he said, oh, you'll talk me into something. And I was going, no. <laughs> so he went on his own. Yeah. And I said, well, let me know, because what will I do with the band? Yeah. So as it happened, I had to put the band on one flight and eventually wait for Rory to... Join him. It turned up at Heathrow Airport in a fresh case room. So he never saw home. He just went, went straight on. From there. And he was so tired, I was saying, What's happening? And he went, oh, I'll tell you where we're going. He <laughs> fell asleep and there was a whole flight he was asleep. But the, the upshot of it was that, he, what he did tell me was that when he got there to the airport, 
it, it, Mick Jagger came by himself. Now, for people who think of limousines and flash lifestyles, mm -hmm. Rory got off the plane. He said it had started to snow. He had a small lamp in one hand and a strat in the other and an overnight bag. And it was starting to snow. While Mick went up and down the taxi rank to negotiate the best fare to Hilversum, <laughs> where the, the uh, concert yeah. hall, yeah. Where they, had the the, they, they were renting a, a concert hall and put the mobile in. So it was, <laughs> Rory it, it went straight into the sessions and he was uh, welcomed by Marshall Chess Jr. Yeah. Said, Rory Gallagher, he said, you're the man for the job. We were all delighted. So it was, it, I don't think there was any question about it. Probably when to get, now Keith didn't turn up the first night. All right. And that was his bad period, should we yeah. say. Plus he wasn't, uh, friends with Mick Jagger, so they weren't talking either. All right, there are. So yeah. a lot of the backdrop of the Stones' own story yeah. was that effectively if Rory had stayed and said nothing, Keep that, that was that was it. Yeah. Uh, and of course the other thing would have gone against him, he was such a Brian Jones fan, he spent his time talking to Charlie and Bill, uh, and then he realised that Charlie and Bill were just sitting there like they were session musicians. Yeah. So I think he recognised that, you know, so he did... Um, Anyway, on the final night, <coughs> he did about five tracks, because uh, I remember him talking about Miss You, um, Hot Stuff, uh, and the night that uh, Keith didn't come down, Mick was, who's uh, the, the sort of main driver of mm. that band, mm. kind of said, Rory, have, have you got a riff? You could start mm. me up. He said, I've got this song. And Rory was had been writing a song, so gave him a riff now. And slightly confused as whether it's hot stuff or miss you, was, uh, but it's, it's a Rory riff. Yeah. And, uh, and so anyway, in the final night, uh, Keith did come down, and then they did a couple of nights together. And uh, Mick said to Rory, "Keith wants to talk to you." <coughs> Bef you know, Rory said, I've "My flight tomorrow. What do you want me to do?" And he said, "Oh, go. Keith wants to have a, a chat with you." So Rory went up to. Keith, sweet, the door was lying open. Keith was comatose in the bed. Rory tried to wake him, and typical Rory, he wouldn't nudge somebody yeah. respect. He was so he went off for an hour and <laughs> came back an hour later, still hadn't woken up. Yeah. So he did that the, all through the night, and, uh, and Keith never came around. He was comatose. So Rory literally took Just his stuff, went off. said nothing, didn't even leave a message, and that just went away, yeah, yeah. And it was today, like today now, you could text somebody. Or yeah, of course. Days, yeah. And then you, you're gone to Japan, that's the... Uh, plus, the colouring of the world at that time, Rory was actually selling more records in Europe than the Stones were. Mm. They were barred from ever touring Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're talking, so, uh, this was Rory's second tour. Mm -hmm. he, he was a god out in Japan because he was one of the first artists ever a uh, uh, rock artist to do it mm. plus it the first concert to do in Hiroshima because mm. they allowed him to do they'd never had a concert because of American music I don't know whatever but, yeah, yeah. but because he was Irish they yeah, asked him to do a concert time, yeah. uh, and that was the request so this was him coming back so he was on that level in fact. Um, speaking of uh Japan there, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, probably has. Um, one day the shop door opened and uh, a load of Japanese tourists came in and one broke away from the gang and ran down the back of the shop to my father and jumped up in his arms. <laughs> a lady, like a young lady, and she's wrapped around him and oh she's yeah. going, oh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and she's going, Michael Crowley, you sold Rory guitar and all this serious excitement all together. Like, and, uh, do you get that kind of thing? No. Does that happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> my father, like <laughs> six foot four, and he's kind of looking. What the hell is this here? You know, but yeah. um, so the Japanese still to this day, like there's serious oh, yeah. fans, like yeah. Yeah, there's it's a great. tribute in. It, it just went past. There was a, yeah. a, a Tokyo tribute yeah. concert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it's I got one in this morning to come. Uh, the, the, the one in Italy. Yeah. Uh, next month. And there was one in uh, Vienna. Was there? Uh, You're going all over the place, basically. Well, I don't go to. To be honest, it's it's you know. I'm trying to encourage the lads to to do some of the, the 
yeah. the, them as well. Yeah, you, you, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's brilliant and it, 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 it's lovely in that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the Japanese are kind of. It, it's funny because that it, it, you know, if it was one of the first gigs they ever saw, and I I, I recently did meet a woman in London, and she was Japanese, and when I was into she. Did didn't get quite jump around. <laughs> she she had been to see Rory in seventy five. Yeah. And could remember every detail of the gig. Yeah, yeah amazing. I think yeah. I told you about the story about uh, the German couple who came to see m uh, my dad in two thousand and nine. Um, they came over and they were just getting to know my dad a bit, and uh, I saw him down the back chatting for hours as he did, and so I fairly knew that it was something to do with Rory, you know. Um, but they then the following year they arrived over. They decided they'd save up for the replica strat, so they came back the following year. But they came back in September of 2010, and they're uh, chatting away to me, and they're buying the guitar, and we did them a good deal in that. And next thing, the woman, she she was able to speak English, but their, her husband couldn't. And um, she asked me, could they have, could Michael sign the receipt because they wanted his name? And I'm saying, unfortunately, he passed away. And she started crying, and then she's translating to her husband, and I was like, what's going on here, you know? And uh, she told me that they'd grown up in East Berlin, they were behind a wall, and they managed to cobble the radio together, and all they listened to was Rory. And so to, to them, that represented freedom, which is amazing, and it's beautiful, like, I think, really, when you think about it. So they were actually quite sad that they had got to see him, though, at some concert, which is brilliant, but... Uh, Amazing stories come out of it, like what music means to people and that, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, interestingly enough, because Rock Palace, which is a big feature in, in the Rory career, <coughs> that first transmission was the first German transmission behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah. Uh, it was the first time that East Germany allowed Western music in, which was a Rory, you know, yeah. tore that show apart, basically. Um, and in fact, I have a telex somewhere. When it it, it 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 was an offer from the East German government for Rory to play uh, a concert <coughs> for the East, East Germany, and it was it was a very attractive offer. Mm -hmm. But it was for uh, Hanukkah, I think, was the, the, the uh, and we passed in it. Yeah. But it, it literally, it's, it, it, the date would have been the day the wall came down. Yeah, wow. Well. So, by, you yeah. know, so, but Rory, it, aside from the, you know, his social conscience it was about playing to people that couldn't readily see. So, he'd, he'd, we went into Poland in 1975. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to yeah. tell the world what was life like, was yeah. like back yeah. then. Mm. But 75... So you, because Rory being Irish, and because of the links, it was kind of jazz, or he was kind of he was accepted by the Polish Jazz Society, mm -hmm. and the government approved it. So we went to do two concerts, which were amazing, and of course, <coughs> they refused to let Rory do encores. Yeah, um, they literally pulled the fire curtain or the spy in the camp. I was told you were tutored a little bit as to look out for somebody. And and it was our show, mm. so this guy went and uh, I said, he's doing an encore. He doesn't. No, he's not. And the whole theory that you'd have to was that basically, you certainly don't give the people what they want. Yes, they want an encore, but they're not getting one. <laughs> and he was from the Pollock Bureau, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, so thereby there was a standoff. All I remember is I had my passport taken off me, <laughs> and I ended up a week in Poland beyond the band. And the second they were flown out, we had to get up at two in the morning and flown out. Uh, I was detained, so they were kind of mm, yeah. fun and games with uh, uh, walking around Warsaw without your passport and not knowing did anyone know <laughs> the other side the, you were ever going to come back out. But it, y Yugoslavia. Uh, and, and now it's all, you know, segregated. It was, it was all under um, Tito, the, mm. or he had just died. So, yeah. uh, and to play in places where you're kind of used to the north, the tensions of the north of Ireland had taught you well. So you 
didn't know about the Croats and the Serbians and the, we didn't know that chemistry but you had to get in the middle of it mm. and you'd end up in it uh, and uh, because I remember going to Belgrade it, it felt, uh, uh, but it the did. promoter the guy was taking his own was from uh, Croatia and they wouldn't allow him in to the radio station mm. Uh, but then back in Ireland too, you know, in 1977 there was a program on RT. Do you remember Ryark? Yes. Yeah, and I think there was a there was a show by Fa Father Brian Darcy, and he did a show about the power of music and the moral influence of pop culture and the generations of Irish people. And in that, right, there's a clip or uh, there's a show, um, there's a photo of Rory looking out at the audience, and you see all the adoring fans, right? And he said he's there in the National Stadium, Dublin, performing "Messing with the Kid," and however. Not everyone is a fan, and for many parents, the noise and confused world of pop really is messing with our ki their kids. Do you remember that kind of Catholic Ireland resistance to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, big yeah. time? Yeah. <laughs> what was the reaction? Did you know about this? Or is there, were there many things like that that you came across? Well, the, the, the f you're kind of delighted with it as well. Yeah. Like, yeah you, know, <laughs> you know, rock and roll was yeah. punk before In punk was punk. Punk wasn't anything as a... R as a teddy boy or a rocker, you know, yeah. a rocker, I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there was a kind of, that whole sort of, say, 50s, post-war, mm. there's a better planet, we shouldn't be dying in the Battle of the Somme or the Second World War or, you know, being conscripted, you know, end of conscription, yeah. then the 60s, the whole thing of, freedom. you know, freedom, I mean, you know, there was all, yeah. Anything that was the first tour of 69 in America, which was supporting Blind Faith, mm. Eric Clapton's band, Ginger Baber, <coughs> and Delaney, Bonnie and Friends. So there's 53 people on a bus, 52 blokes and one woman, yeah. Bonnie. Yeah. So, um, and at the age of 18, you kind of, they were all serious mm. uh, junkies. Mm. I mean, you kind of. So you d the culturally, then you start to see it spin off. But the point I come to then is going up into Canada, uh, and underneath the bus used to be some road boxes. <coughs> there was a tractor trailer unit with all the equipment. But anyway, and we'd be stopping in the uh, 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 going up over Minnesota, some back under hours waiting for them. And then what it was, you thought they were getting rid of their drugs, whatever, they'd have yeah. couriers come up. But actually, with the, going underneath the bus were road boxes with uh, people dodging the draft, being driven into Canada oh, yeah. because they're unlikely yeah, to stop. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah. So you, yeah, you didn't let it stop you, obviously, anyway. So, yeah. Well, there was always a, an edge to mm. uh, life, and that's. Similarly, mm. back in Ireland, and, and okay, there was respect for the powers that yeah. being bought. They didn't certainly respect. I mean, if, if you go back to the show band, which was only just before that, mm. where if you were a working musician, your livelihood was interrupted for six weeks with Lent. Mm. Yeah, you couldn't do gigs. You know, you're barred. So it was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, particularly the bands that were, had been professional. Yeah, Jeez. they had to hide themselves and you know, yeah, or go off to England and try and compete with. Everybody was fishing for the same pool in North yeah, London yeah, to get yeah. gigs. <coughs> so, um, tell me, is the uh, Declan Quinn has been working on a film? Is that coming soon, or what's the stage? Close. <laughs> <laughs> like we Christmas. talked about it before. <coughs> so. Yeah, it'll be cool. I can't wait to see though. Well, I mean, yeah, it 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 it, 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 it ha was arriving at a very certain point. Declan, who's a director of photography, mm. he's a director, so he he has a script at the whole thing. So he had it. It was up and running because he works all that he'd worked all the time with Jonathan Demme, mm -hmm. uh, the late director. So who? Had, he did all the documentaries on Neil Young and various things, so it was a great company. But he, Rory, hadn't come on Jonathan Demme's radar mm -hmm. until Declan introduced him, and uh, so the next thing he became big a fan. big Rory yeah. fan. Yeah. So I went over <coughs> and spent a couple of days with both of them, and you know whatever they wanted to talk about or hear or whatever. So uh, and it was all. Jonathan Demme had become executive producer, director, 
Declan was director of photography and director. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, currently you'll see Declan's work in um, Black 47. Oh, yeah. All the Oof, photography in yeah, that is Declan, yeah. yeah. That's brilliant. And his brother's Aidan Quinn, yeah, the yeah. actor. Who's, um, so his whole family is steeped in this. That, yeah. um, and he did all the early U2 videos as well. Mm. So he's, he's a great musician mm. and he's the man for the job. Yeah. So it's no, there was a setback, sadly, because Jonathan died. Yeah. died. <coughs> More recently, since we moved to Universal, or Rory's catalog over to Universal, they've now come up with the budget. So they're talking to, mm. um, they want to make it a, as soon as possible. I mean, they did send a proposal like as it tails out of school, which yeah. I turned back and said no. Couldn't, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm waiting on the revised I suppose, scenario yeah, because yeah. they don't. Uh, people come into it, and they, you know, and I'm trying to explain to them. Rory is passionate about his work, so why wouldn't I be passionate? Mm, yeah. And I'm not going to sign off on anything that's he wouldn't. Not want. exactly as he'd want. Yeah, to. you know, and they all think, oh, well, you'd just be delighted and make a film on Rory. You're going to go, yeah. yeah. Who's portraying him? Do what's right portraying him? Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. Declan I trust yeah um, and I, I brought him to the party and I said but well, you know we're a player in this we're not just you mm. know hand over your archive and yeah you know so anyway they they now understand that yeah yeah good so yeah. it'll be happening yeah, soon hopefully <laughs> yeah so and what what about a, a book because I think it would be great to hear your story um is have you been writing down getting ready planning a memoir of sort yeah, I've uh, lots of things written, lots yeah. of notes made, lots and lots. But the difficulty is that uh, you know, to me, it's it's about Rory's music, number one. And mm. I did, it, you know, until you got re-established, if you, if you like, his catalogue, and got some new titles to the mm. canon, to you know, like Wheels and Wheels was t to show that Rory was. The acoustic side yeah, of Rory, which yeah. is very important mm. to him, and and uh, you know th that was quite a mission to pull that album together because it's actually a ghost story I, I, for another day. Yeah, I mean it's absolutely it was going to the other side, and other people involved with it had the same experience. Yeah, it's it's quite peculiar. So. But that takes a couple of years. So if you start going, well, well I'll leave the album and I'll, I'll write my book. You know, it, oh, it, so it's, it's like a never-ending story, really, like, in well, a way. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, I had this with the current book that's out. And yeah, yeah. The guy was kind of vibrating me for not... Uh, and I was saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my own book. Yeah. I said, but you wouldn't be writing a book about Rory now mm. if it wasn't for what happened in the last 10 years because mm. you're not... You're yeah, definitely not into the older history. Yeah. Okay, you try and do research of that, but you're never going to, uh, you know, that's something I want to get right and yeah. it takes time to remember everything or research it yourself. So, but meantime, we're, we're uh, getting Universal to put his music out and we're pushing them because it, it's really hard slog mm. getting it, you know, your four major companies now who own everything in the world other than a yeah. few independents. <laughs> and you know, you have to rattle that well, cage yeah. to get attention. Yeah. You know, and it sadly it, 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 in Rory's time, and I always used to say, to Rory, it's the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Mm. You know, it was all the artists who were flabbing about, and yeah, uh, yeah. the ones who kept it quiet and played music didn't. You know. Mm. And so. what do you feel most proud of after all that work that you've put into it in the last decade or more? What do you feel most proud of? What of your achievements? Oh God. <laughs> Never thought about that. Um, I'm still alive, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, I suppose if you'd in, back in '95, you know, uh, you know, I never expected Rory to die, even mm. though his health was it, yeah, just became. Yeah. You, there was it was always that box of spirit and Rory that he'd, he'd seemed to come through everything. So he didn't plan yeah. for that yeah and even though you know he was actually mm -hmm. recorded as the longest patient in intensive care uh, at king's college hospital at that time right. it, um, 
he survived and you know and then it got to the point oh well get him the ambulance to go take him back to the Cromwell hospital mm. it'd be closer to you so after three months you know you're in intensive care every day so uh, so it was secondary what the music but that's what Rory would have how it would so I suppose yeah I'd, I'd was it I'd I take a little bow to say well here we are yeah coming well 23 years so oh, 25 yeah. that his music is alive and well mm. And it's all available. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, brilliant. You know, and that dare I say, and, and for a long time. Owner Ravi, who's here, yeah. I'll take a, his album title, "Hand Me Down." Yeah. That, in a sense, I feel my kids will. Yeah, yeah. Carry Absolutely. it on. Yeah, yeah. Beyond that, so that's brilliant. it's kind of a, it's a torch you just to pass, pass it on. You know. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask a few of the guys. Would they like to ask you a question? Do you want to ask him a question? Yeah, um, I just would like to, um, for such an international phenomenon that your brother was, is he um, recognised locally for, or is it a case of um, the prophet in his own city? Because he is obviously a major international phenomenon musically. But apart from this particular library, which I think is a super setup, uh, and the plaza in Paul Street, there's very little evidence that Rory was a, a, a court phenomenon, basically. Should more be done to celebrate his cork roots and that? You've tried, I suppose. But I, it, yes and no. I, I suppose, it, it, you know, I mean, with the CIT, the, it's the Rory Gallery Theatre out at CIT as well. Um, there are a few things, and this is what I've been trying to say to City mm -hmm. Hall and the Tourist Board, because they're all looking for the new Titanic water. They're all looking for, you know, and, and they have it. So I'll confess it was in the city hall yesterday morning, so I had the same conversation. So we're getting there. I, I, I think that, you know, and uh, when it comes, it'll be good and it'll sustain. It's not just going to be. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, there are a couple of new ideas. So now, Donald, I have a second question for you briefly. Um, Rory was a guitar hero. Who were his heroes? Uh, <coughs> I suppose you, you, you start with the obvious from Lonnie Donegan, who wasn't quite a guitar hero. Yeah. Like it was a chord mm. structure, yeah. which was yeah. a Woody Guthrie. I suppose Django Reinhardt, yeah. mm. Doc Watson. In the electric sense, obviously, there was Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, mm. Jimmy Page. Uh, you know, uh, but they're all, you know, the, the same models. Um, odd people like John Hammond Jr. Uh, obviously all the blues guys. Muddy, I mean, his soul slide playing was founded on Muddy Waters. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. uh, Muddy Waters was, that was it. And I yeah. think probably looking back, uh, after 71, the world didn't get any better for Rory doing the uh, Muddy Waters London sessions yeah, yeah. to him was, you know, so, okay, we spoke about the Stones, but <coughs> to Rory mm. that was, uh, well, this is coming down a couple of times, but... Yeah. I did, I did see a photograph, I think, uh, of himself, Lonnie Donegan and Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Would, would my memory be failing me, or...? Well, there were two other sessions. Rory yeah. did... Um, 71 he did the Muddy Water Sessions, yeah. 73 he did uh, Jerry Lee Lewis yeah. London Sessions yeah. and then in 75 into 76 he did the Lonnie Donegan oh, yeah. Sessions. Yeah. Uh, you know, which he was, dis the, 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 the Lonnie one, Rory was meant to be the producer and he was quite busy at the time and we just signed Rory over to Chrysalis Records, and so they were picking up the. It 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 happened by a, 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 a weird way. It was twenty third of December. Rory was headlining the Albert Royal Albert Hall in London, and I, and we were flying off the next day back to Cork. So I, I hadn't managed to get a present, and I was going, "What could you get, Rory?" And then. It, I knew every time I'd buy him something. So this guy came down with a, a new drum kit for the drummer to try out. And I got chatting to him about, you know, what he did. And it turned out he was a bass player with Lonnie Donegan now and again. 
So I said, oh, Lonnie Donegan, or oh, oh, here, or blah, 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 where is he in the planet these days? And he went, he's in London. And I said, would he not come to the gig tonight? And he said, I don't know. And I said, oh, I'd love to get in touch with him. And the guy was nervous about doing it, but what he did, it was pay phones. So I'd run the coin, and he, he dialed the number out, he answered, and he, here you go, talk to Lonnie Lanigan. And I was, anyway, <laughs> long story short, I said, look, at the Albert Hall, blah, 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 y you know, my brothers, you were the here, you know, I'm here at all the time, but I said, and I know it's short notice, we'd like to invite you to the gig, if, if, if you could make it. And he said, well, son, he said, it's like this, he said, if I turned up, he said, would anybody know me? And he said, I'd hate to arrive at back in, and uh, I said, I promise you, I'd be there myself. And he said, well, where would I be sitting? Where would I be uh, at the side of the stage? And I said, look, I know the record company have taken a box and they've got hospitality in there. You'll be in, you'll be well looked after. So he turned up. And he turned up in a, 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 a black, uh, in a bow tie, yeah. black, you know, <laughs> very formal. And a frilly shirt or whatever. And, uh, and he said, am I dressed okay? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but actually Rory's concert in 75 was the first rock concert. They had banned rock from since the early 70s, after the nice had burnt of the flag or whatever. And uh, so Rory was, they, they took a chance on putting it. So, so uh, and it was, it had been that form, so Lonnie was there. And so I said, look, last favour, Lonnie. Rory doesn't know you're here. You'll meet him after the gig. But it would, would you do the other one and announce him on stage? Because that's my Christmas Probably present yeah, right. to Rory. Yeah. And uh, he said, OK, son. He said, so long as you go out and you give me an introduction. <laughs> and he said, because people out there won't know me. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, do your best. I don't want to walk out cold. And he was terrible. So it was, the double effect was I went out and did this big thing, the audience went bananas for Lonnie Donegan. Rory's backstage waiting to be announced, and here's it being announced by Lonnie Donegan, and goes into complete <laughs> shock. And it took 15 minutes for Rory Good to go on the stage. Stage fright, <laughs> yeah. mixed in with shock. Oh, oh shock, yeah. yeah. And all I remember Rory walking on that, and he wagged a finger at me, and he said, don't you ever do anything like that to me again. <laughs> and I said to Rory, happy Christmas. <laughs> and he went, I know. He said, but <laughs> Not in the click. So, <laughs> so there's Lonnie Donnie. Anyway, who actually yeah. is, is on the Wheels Within Wheels album. Yeah. Mm. And he did that, uh, he did a, a Rory tribute up in the Buxton Opera House. Mm. Um, and I became good friends with Lonnie. Possibly, uh, I'd met him oddly enough, I took him to see Gordon Lightfoot and, in, and to a concert, I got tickets. and. and because he lived out in uh, uh, Palm Springs. He came in and he came in to, anyway, he was to try and get his daughter a job. And I, anyway, long story short, he saw mm. life. So, uh, and saw Lonnie uh, in uh, just a few days before he died. He called me up one night and he said, Look, he said, I'm in town for a few nights. He said, I've just been given a new guitar. And he said, I've no one to. Play to or show off to. <laughs> and, I said, oh, that, uh, uh, and he said, Would you come up to the, the flat? And uh, I said, Yeah, okay, Lonnie. And, uh, uh, we'd, I'd, on the Capo label, I'd done Lonnie's album. The first bit of money I got out of BMG, I said, Well, Rory's hero mm. can't get an album out these days. Mm. So I knew Lonnie had some recordings made and I developed it with BMG which ultimately led to the Skiffle Sessions with Van. Mm. And Van came in and did the two tracks on the capo recording in the studio. And then he said, oh, this will be done. I want the right to do it live. So that's what, which was great. Because that got, anyway, that's part of my connection with Lonnie. Yeah. So I, I got up to Lonnie's flat, and he'd taken delivery of a Martin guitar, which was the Lonnie Donegan model. And it was a complete full circle. It was like seeing Rory with his first wooden guitar mm. from Crowley's. Mm. He was so enthralled with actually holding uh, the instrument. 
And I thought, God, it doesn't change. No matter yeah, how warm yeah. you get. He was the kid That's, with the guitar. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, brilliant. Cuddled the guitar almost. Yeah, and excellent. He, he died a few days later. Oh, man. Up in, um, and I, I was in Peterborough. And I remember going up to the, in the train to Peterborough and thinking, this, this should be, they should be closing the mall, flags at half mast, yeah. mm. and walking down a long driveway mm. to the, this crematorium. And flowers there, and it was so oh, bless you from Elton John, and oh uh, stones we love you, but they didn't have the jet fuel money to come to the funeral. Yeah. And getting to this, forty people in a little church, and bless it was Joe Brown, Albert Lee, yes. um, Freddie Parrott, uh, uh, stage and music hall yeah, guys. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of any other guitar players, but I thought this is. This is criminal. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, yeah. And, and that where are, you know. Yeah. And then his wife came over, I was, was a little bit late, and she came over and said, you're doing the eulogy. And uh, actually, uh, if we have the time to, because it would be great to do something with Lonnie within the year. Yeah. Uh, I've, 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 to help Lonnie out at one point was a circumstance. He was living in Spain, and he was all over the shop, and three divorces, bankruptcy a few times. And I said, Lonnie, why don't you come back and uh, why don't you come and live in Ireland? Because I knew all the stories, his Irish connections. And yeah. His aunt was, lived in Ulm and he, he used to tell me, I said, and he said, oh, and I said, there's a tax, you know, thing, and you could be exempt and da, da, da. And he said, well, how would I go about that? And I said, well, I'll call into the Irish embassy. And it was an ambassador at the time, Ted Barrington. And I said, uh, what would a guy like him yeah. have to do? You know, now everybody wants one. But yeah. Back then, and he said, "What a defection, <laughs> Lonnie Donegan, British <laughs> <laughs> guitar hero." <laughs> he was like, "Wow!" Yeah. This is, this is, he said, "Just get me his um, genealogy chart," and he said, "With a name like Donegan, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's going to yeah. be for a second in there. So I said to Lonnie, "So, Lonnie said, I, he said, oh, I could, I think I can do that online.' It was new internet at the time for him, and uh, he said, "I'll come back to you in a couple of days." The phone rang at seven in the evening and he said, Son, are you near a, a fax machine? And I said, I'm sitting next to one. And he said, Is it private? And I said, Yeah. I said, I'm the only one here in the office. And he, he, he said, Fine. He said, uh, Fax come through. And he said, By the way, he said, How many Gallagher's in Cork City? And I said, Well, I couldn't tell you. I said, I remember when I was going to school, there was only one other Gallagher family. Uh, and I'm still friends with them, but I said, they were the only Gallagher's in Cork City with the telephone, and they never forgave me, because <laughs> they got all the wrong <laughs> <Roy Bar, laughs> phone calls from around the world. Yeah. But I said, it, 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 I said, probably be more common nowadays, but there you go. And I said, well, he said, well, in that case, we must be related. And I said, I said, Lonnie, wouldn't I love to think of what blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, watch the facts. So he's descended from a John Donegan, who was born in Ballydonagan in North Cork, oh. who married, uh, married, I think it's a Mary Gallagher. So he did Don't get Don't tell married. me you're not related. So anyway, the, 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 their, they sailed off to Gibraltar. He, so he got, he got all the things. Anyway, he, 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 he became Irish and he got, I remember, he put him off for the Irish post Lifetime Achievement Award, yeah, which he got. Yeah, so, he's, yeah. so in the end days, it was a yeah. very kind of uh, cordial. And he came over and I wanted, to, I got him to do with, um, it was a song Rory and I learned as kids, Nobody Loves Like an Irishman. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember mm. that. Yeah. And Lonnie, uh, I asked Lonnie about it one night in the car where we were, and it, it said that he had forgotten the song. And I said, but you wrote it. And he said, I might have done some. He said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I said, it was number one in Ireland. Mm. And I said, it was certainly, you know, it was a great piece of writing. And he said, would you sing it for me? So <laughs> I sang a couple of lines. And he said, oh, yeah, no, I think. I, so he called me the following day. And he said, you know, he said, I'd forgotten the song. And the reason he said I forgot it, and he said, I didn't actually write it. He said, I bought a book of unpublished uh, poetry right. that was unpublished. And he said, I, I saw this, and he said, I put a calypso to it, because yeah. I thought the poem, and he said, 
the guy in the Telegraph now says it's the writings of Jane Austen. And it was a, 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 a letter to her uh, Irish yeah. boyfriend that her family had refused, uh, stopped her from seeing. He was in the military and he'd come over from Ireland. And this was the writings of Jane Austen, back to oh, um, yeah. Nobody Loves Like an Irish Man, which would act, because mm -hmm. I, I told Karis Matthew to, uh, to play it one day in the radio, and she, I, I, she kind of, w I'll play Lani Donegan, but she didn't play the track, but then I realised afterwards, because it refers to the Koran and various yeah, things, yeah. the BBC would, yeah. you know. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no bother. Thanks. That's a, that's brilliant to hear that now as well. Yeah. Um, I suppose we'll have to let the and library Pete, back Pete, to Pete Townsend's Pete Townsend. background is Cork. Yeah, yeah. Because I was saying because uh, some in the Arcadian sixties yeah. or whatever, and more recently, uh, and uh, and I said, Pete, you know Cork. You know what I'm talking said, and he said, Number Nine Barrack Street. My grandfather oh. was from Barrack Street. Didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Anyway, I think we'll have to let the library get back to being the library. <laughs> Thanks a million, Donald. It was brilliant chatting to you. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks.